Welcome to part three of this short video series on legal professional privilege as it applies under the Right to Information Act 2009. I'm sure this will come as a complete surprise, but I'm still Sharon Harrington and I'm still an officer of the Office of the Information Commissioner's Inquiry Service. In this video, which will be much shorter than the other two, we're going to be looking at a couple of practical examples of documents that are generally covered by privilege, some of the tools available on the Office of the Information Commissioner's website that will help you with applying privilege, and looking briefly at writing your decision if you decide documents are exempt on the grounds that they're covered by legal professional privilege. In video one, we covered access under the RTI Act, pro-disclosure bias and exempt information, and the fundamental basics of legal professional privilege. And in video two, we covered advice and litigation privilege, non-privileged documents becoming privilege, third-party communications, and waiver of privilege. Just a quick overview. Legal professional privilege attaches to confidential communications made in the course of a lawyer-client relationship for the dominant purpose of seeking legal advice or for use in on-foot or anticipated legal proceedings. Legal professional privilege belongs to the client, not the lawyer, and it can be expressly or impliedly waived. And documents which are subject to legal professional privilege are exempt from release under the Right to Information Act 2009, and also exempt from release under Schedule 3 of the Information Privacy Act 2009. The legal professional privilege status of certain documents that do tend to come up in applications for documents under the Right to Information Act has been previously decided, and I'm just going to run through them. We have previously touched on expert reports, but generally confidential communications between a lawyer and a third party expert will attract privilege where the communications are made for the dominant purpose of use in existing or reasonably anticipated litigation. Lawyers' briefing instructions to an expert will also constitute confidential communications made for the dominant purpose of use in litigation and will, on their face, attract legal professional privilege. However, you will have to look at all of the circumstances surrounding those instructions to determine if privilege applies. If you're looking at drafts of material prepared by the expert as opposed to the final report, it's possible that they could attract privilege. Again, you are really going to have to look at all of the circumstances surrounding it. There is opposing, opposing legal viewpoints out there as to whether or not drafts of expert opinions and expert material can attract privilege. So I cannot give you a definitive viewpoint. All I can say that is if you do for some reason find that you have drafts of a briefed expert on your file to be aware that it could go either way and to really look at the circumstances. Lawyers working documents, that is draft materials, if the final would have been privileged then the drafts can be privileged as well. So drafts and notes, memos of research conducted, collations and summaries of documents and notes or recordings of conversations with the client can definitely be privileged and it's not uncommon particularly where you're dealing with in-house lawyers to find significant numbers of drafts on files. Billing documents that is bills for services provided by Crown Law or outside external legal providers generally will not attract privilege. The amount charged for the services, including the final amount, won't be privileged. If the itemized lists of cost reveals the nature of the advice given or nature of the privileged communications, that may be privileged, but as a general rule, the actual amount charged for the services will not be privileged. Cost agreements or client agreements will generally not be privileged. Well, it's true that they generally are a requirement that they exist before there can be any sort of relationship that's going to give rise to the existence of privileged documents. The client or cost agreement themselves will not be privileged. There can be exceptions to this if there is something in the client or cost agreement that does contain something that could constitute the giving of legal advice. However, as a general rule, client and cost agreements are fairly standard between clients and there would not be anything in that would generally be subject to privilege. 
You would be aware that some regulatory agencies and investigatory bodies do have the power to compel the production of documents from agencies, even where those documents are subject to legal professional privilege. Generally, there will be some sort of statement in the Act that says that doing so does not, in fact, waive privilege. So if you do have a file and there are documents, privileged documents showing that they've been provided to an agency in response to such a power, um, privilege will still be maintained on those documents, unless it's been waived in some other way, of course. So you don't need to be too concerned about, about that. If you do have evidence that they've been provided to a regulatory agency or an investigatory body or a, I guess a commission of some kind in response to the exercise of such a power, um, but the privilege is still maintained on them, then they can still refuse access to them under Schedule 3, Section 7 on the grounds that they're subject to legal professional privilege. Okay. So we have a number of tools on the Office of the Information Commissioner website which are likely to be of assistance to you when you're making your privilege decision. So this is the Office of the Information Commissioner website, www.oic.qld.gov.au. And the first thing I want to show you is the information sheet. Now this is an information sheet that's prepared for members of the community that explains legal professional privilege to them and why they would have been refused access in very plain English. So you'll find this under Guidelines for Community Members, Access and Amendment, And honestly, the fastest way to find it, regardless of what browser you're using, is going to be to hit Control F and Legal Professional Privilege. So you'll see it comes up here, Legal Professional Privilege, a guide for applicants. Now this is actually intended to do double duty, as many of our information sheets for applicants are. It's an information sheet for applicants to inform them about an exempt information provision but it's also intended to be utilized by agencies who say might have an applicant who's making inquiries about seeking access to documents that they simply are not going to be granted. It's the sort of thing that you might be able to give them in order to explain to them why they simply are not going to get access to the documents they're inquiring about. And this way, if they are inclined to perhaps have a slight amount of mistrust in you as an agency, maybe having something from a third party that they might, you know, not have a relationship with or might not might not yet have any any issues with, um, might help them to understand or to tr to trust, perhaps is a better word, why they're not going to be given access to it. So you'll see that it runs through the basics. What is legal professional privilege? Does it apply to government lawyers? Does it apply to current legal proceedings? What if the proceedings are finalized? Will I be able to access this information as part of my RTI application? Essentially, no if the elements are satisfied. So you can access this on the website, download it as a PDF, email the link, or include it in the letter if you think it might be of use. So that's the information sheet. Simple, plain English, written for members of the community who might not have most much exposure to or much experience with the concept of legal professional privilege. Now there's also a guideline, and the easiest way to find the guideline, you can obviously see that I've searched for this before on this browser, is to use the search box and hit legal professional privilege, and it should be one of the top results. So you see here actually the information sheet for applicants comes up and then the guidelines for government. So the guidelines are intended for agency decision makers and other people in agencies and they're more complicated than the information sheets for community members obviously and they go through essentially the elements of the exempt information provision. Uh, notice there's footnotes throughout, so they cite relevant case law for the provisions, also available as a PDF or as a print function. Now this will run you through essentially the basics of legal professional privilege and much of what we've discussed already in these videos. Common law principles, you see advice and litigation privilege running through the basics here the various elements, this will probably look very familiar if you've seen other videos, some excerpts from relevant cases, a couple of examples, all of the things we've discussed here today, some more cases there. 
So if you're wanting to write your decision and looking to learn more about legal professional privilege, the guideline is definitely the next step up there. So we've got more cases here, how to apply it, particular issues, types of documents, and then down here we've got all of the relevant citations for the relevant case law. This can also be very uh, useful when you're writing your decision, as you should, of course, feel free to um, utilize text directly from the guidelines if you would find it useful when you're preparing your decision to send out to the applicant. Now the other thing that you might find useful is the annotated legislation. Now if you're not familiar with the annotated legislation, what it essentially is, is the entire Right to Information Act that is, well for want of a better description, annotated uh, with additional information including information from case laws and you know commentary from the office of the information commissioner it's essentially the next step up from a guideline now legal professional privilege is an exempt information provision exempt information provisions are contained in schedule 3 so if you look down the border here you'll see schedule 3 exempt information and we can go straight to it now it's section 7 information subject to legal professional privilege and if you click into there you'll see oh, it also links to the information sheet for community members but here you'll see on the right hand side um, a number of links through to all the various information about legal professional privilege now this is as I said the next level up from the guidelines so more complicated but if you're looking for something specific about an element of legal professional privilege, the annotated legislation is going to be the place to go. It also has key published decisions applying Schedule 3, Section 7 of the RTI Act. So as you'd be aware, there is a significant number of decisions on the Office of the Information Commissioner website. And if you're looking for ones about legal professional privilege, there are a lot of those as well. Now, this tells you what basically the key decisions are about legal professional privilege and gives a brief rundown of what they actually look at here. So those are just three tools on the OIC website that are going to be useful for you. If you want to know more about legal professional privilege, if you need to know about a specific element of it, or if you're wanting to write your decision there. So the annotated legislation, the guidelines, and the information sheets for community members. So when you as the decision maker are satisfied the documents have been applied for are subject to legal professional privilege and as such they are exempt from release, you're going to need to communicate that to the applicant. When you're refusing access to documents or to information contained in a document because it is subject to legal professional privilege, you should set out that the RTI Act allows you to refuse access to legal professional privilege information because it is exempt information. It's very good to refer to the relevant sections of the Right to Information Act, or if you are dealing with an Information Privacy Act application, to explain why it is that you're referring to the sections of the Right to Information Act. Set out the elements of legal professional privilege that need to be established, and set out how the documents or information that has been applied for meets those elements. It's very important that you not refer to the specifics of the communications that would waive the privilege you're trying to protect. So you can speak in general terms, you know, communication between business unit and legal services. You wouldn't say communication between business unit and legal services seeking advice on how to get rid of barking dogs. You would not go into that level of detail because that right there would probably waive the privilege you were attempting to protect. It's very important to remember that despite the fact that legal professional privilege can be a relatively complicated area of the law at times, there's no need to use complicated language or to quote huge paragraphs of case law. Use plain English and short sentences. Don't quote case law unless it's absolutely necessary. Reword wherever possible to make it simpler. Please feel free to use the words from OIC's guidelines, OIC's annotated legislation, and OIC's own decisions. Um, state the relevant principles in your own words, or as I said, use OIC's words, and then simply cite the case in a footnote. So that's the end of the video series. I hope that you found at least a little bit useful. One thing to keep in mind is that legal privilege 
can be a fairly complex area of the law. Uh, hopefully won't be too complex for you when you're applying it and you'll have nice simple files that are clearly you know request for legal advice and the legal advice being delivered back but sometimes it can get really complicated and it is constantly developing um, this video series was recorded in November 2016 and I've made every attempt to keep it at a high enough level that it should age fairly well but if you have any doubts about its currency please check the OIC's guidelines and annotated legislation which you should know how to find now that I've shown it to you you. Um, or you can contact us on the inquiry service. And remember, whether or not privilege attaches to documents for which an applicant applies is always going to depend on the circumstances of each particular case. So you're always going to have to look at the documents, look at the purpose for which it was created, look at who created it, and look at all of the circumstances surrounding it before you make your decision. If you do need to contact the inquiry service, this is how you can get hold of us. Um, myself, a member of our team, would be more than happy to assist you with any of your inquiries.